Hello and welcome to season two of Safeguarding Days as we enter into 2021. We've rebranded, we've changed our look, but we're still about the same core thing, giving you the latest safeguarding news, updates and getting behind the latest safeguarding case reviews and keeping ourselves on track with everything that's going on with the world of keeping children safe. In this episode, we're really going to be focusing in on depression, anxiety and mental health and how we talk to children worried about coronavirus. The way we're going to shape this episode is going to be slightly different and you're going to see this a lot in this new series is where it's almost going to be aimed a little bit towards parents because research tells us that whilst it's important that we as professionals understand what we can do to support children, it's also important that we support parents in their approach to supporting children and young people as they work through more troubling times within their own lives. If a child or young person is worried about coronavirus, there are things you can do to help. And if they're struggling with their mental health, there's so much that we can do as professionals to support them and their wider sphere of influence to offer that advice to help support them and keep them safe. We know there's a lot of uncertainty in the world at the moment, and there won't always be answers to the questions that children are asking. But we can help to have those conversations in a safe and open way, allowing those children and young people to feel listened to and help to work with them to help them develop their own individual and bespoke support pathway towards a better outcome for them. In this episode, we're going to talk through eight tips from the Blackpool Better Start around how to parents can have those conversations with children and young people. Before we look at some of the signs and depressions of anxiety in children, we talk about how we can help children with anxieties and depression. And then also we're going to speak about what we can do to support young people or what you can do as a parent if you start to feel worried that a child is feeling suicidal. And then finally, we're going to look at some of the different support pathways available to children in terms of getting support for your child or a child that we as professionals are looking after in respect of their mental health. So as I said at the beginning, I'm going to pitch this episode as though I was talking to a parent, carer or guardian of a child or young person who's worried about coronavirus. Now, to reiterate the message I just said a moment ago, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world and there isn't always going to be answers to every question a child asks. What it's important that we do is have and allow the children to have safe and open conversations with us about what it is they're worried about. Talking about feelings and worries is a really key starting point for any conversation and you should work really hard to encourage your child to talk to you or a trusted adult about how they're feeling. The NSPCC have got some fantastic resources around having difficult conversations with children. And it's important to remember as well, this doesn't always have to be face to face. Children might find it easier writing their thoughts down. You may wish to create a feelings box where you put all those good, sad or difficult feelings in and then talk about them at the end of the day with that child or young person. For younger children, play can be a great way to help them talk about their worries or give them a good distraction when they're upset. But not being able to play with their friends can be hard. Set aside time to play together and have fun. You might notice some changes in your children's behaviour. Young children may start thumb sucking or bedwetting and older children may have mood swings and become irritable. You might also notice changes in appetite or sleep patterns. These can be ways your child is experiencing stress. It takes time to adjust to the new normal and children may need lots of support and reassurance to help them through it. Your child might have a very real fear of the people they love and care for dying or getting seriously unwell. It can be difficult, but it's okay to have conversations about death. Mary Curie has advice on talking to children about death and Childline has advice for young people when someone dies. And there's some really great resources from both those organisations that can support you as you prepare your young person or your child to work through those scenarios or just to have that confidence yourself to know those resources are there in the unfortunate 
event that you may need them. Some young people might be anxious about if there will be enough food. Have conversations about what they might see in the news and talk about how what they see online isn't always the same as what's happening. Involve them in food shopping and be mindful of conversations you might have with other adults about frustrations when it comes to buying food. For children with eating disorders, worries about food can be really challenging. Talk to them about their worries and speak to BEAT, the eating disorder charity, if you need advice. I'll be sure to link in the description below some of the resources for up-to-date information and support from the charity BEAT around eating disorders and COVID-19. There's some really great stuff there. Rolling news and social media can cause a lot of anxiety. Remind children of the facts and explain what false or sensationalised information is. It's important to allow your children to ask questions about the things they see online. And if you don't know the answer, letting them know that some things aren't certain or known yet is okay. Talking about feelings and worries with children and young people is important. The second point that the Blackpool Better Start tells us about is this idea of keeping in touch with family and friends, but also balancing that screen time. It's important to understand the huge impact of missing family, friends and schoolmates that can have on children of all ages. Let your child express these emotions and don't minimalise their feelings. Finding ways to have social interactions can be tricky, especially if you're worried about screen time. But it is possible to find the right balance with using smartphones and webcams to keep in touch. Talk together about how you can all manage your screen time as a family. The benefits of alleviating anxiety by staying connected to friends and families cannot be underestimated. With most socialising moving online, it's important to have conversations on how an increase in screen time can have an impact on everyone's mental health and self-esteem. It's okay to let your children know that the way they might feel is a normal response to an abnormal situation. Try to create structure and routine. It's normal for a lack of routine and structure to make children and young people feel anxious and upset. It can be challenging to find a routine that works for everyone, especially if you're juggling working from home with taking care of children with different needs. A rotor or timetable, even a loose one, can help alleviate anxiety. Structure can help children see what's happening next in the day. Look forward to a rest of the rest of the week and differentiate between weekends and weekdays. Finding practical things to do to alleviate anxiety and worries can feel tricky when you're mostly indoors. Some things you can try are yoga, mindfulness, puzzle games, crafting projects, cooking, exercise classes and growing plants from seeds. There's some really great tools and ideas there. And then finally, help give children a sense of control. Uncertainty about the future, like exams and when they're going to be allowed to go out, can be stressful. While there's no right answer, there are a lot of free online tools and resources that can help children work through their worries. Have a look online together to find ones that work best for your child and help them feel like they have control. Let your children read advice and information that's tailored to them. Childline by the NSPCC have some great advice tools on coronavirus and lots of tools to help alleviate anxiety. Young Minds have advice for young people on looking after their mental health while self-isolating. And the Department of Psychiatry has guides to help explain to children why and how someone has died as a result of coronavirus. Share Child Life's Calm Zone, a unique space for children and young people filled with breathing exercises, activities, games and videos to help let go of the stresses. Signs of depression or anxiety in children and knowing how to talk to your child about mental health can be really, really difficult. Signs of depression or anxiety in children can sometimes look like normal behaviour, particularly in teenagers who can keep their feelings to themselves really well. It's also natural for children or young people to feel stressed or anxious about things like exams or moving to a new school. But while these experiences can be really difficult, 
they're different from longer term depression or anxiety, which affects how a child or young person feels every day. It can help to think about what's normal for your child and if you've noticed signs that they've been behaving differently recently. So let's start by looking at some of the signs of depression. Signs of depression in children and teenagers can include persistent low moods or lack of motivation, not enjoying things like they used to enjoy doing, becoming withdrawn and spending less time with friends and family, experiencing low self-esteem or feeling like they're worthless, feeling tearful or upset regularly, or changes in their eating or sleeping habits. With respect to signs of anxiety, they differ slightly. Some of the signs of anxiety in children and teenagers can include becoming socially withdrawn and avoiding spending time with friends and family, feeling nervous or like they're on edge a lot of the time, suffering panic attacks, feeling tearful, upset or angry, or having trouble sleeping and changes in their eating habits. So what can you do to help? Realising that your child may be struggling with their mental health and experiencing anxiety or depression can be hard to accept. Sometimes parents can feel like it's their fault or they want to know why their child is struggling with a mental health problem. This is completely understandable. But the most important thing you can do to reassure your child and not judge them for how they're feeling. Some of the different ways that you could help a child that's struggling are letting them know that you're there for them and you're on their side. Try talking to them over text or on the phone if they don't feel able to talk in person. Being patient and staying calm and approachable, even if their behaviour upsets you. Recognising that their feelings are valid and letting them know it's okay for them to be honest about what it's like for them to feel this way. Thinking of healthy ways to cope that you could do together, like we said earlier, yoga, breathing exercises or mindfulness exercises, just generally doing things together. Encouraging them to talk to their GP, someone at their school or childline, especially if they're finding it hard to talk to somebody at home. And one of the most important things to remember is to take care of yourself and to get support too if you need it. Try not to blame yourself for what's happening and to stay hopeful about your child's recovery. If you become worried that a child is feeling suicidal, whilst not every child with depression or anxiety will feel suicidal, sometimes mental health problems can feel overwhelming for children and young people. If a young person talks about wanting to hurt or harm themselves or expresses suicidal feelings, they should always be taken seriously. Some of the signs that a child or young person may be having suicidal feelings or thinking about suicide could include them becoming more depressed or withdrawn, spending a lot of time by themselves. An increase in dangerous behaviours like dr taking drugs or drinking alcohol. Becoming obsessed with the idea of suicide, death or dying, which could include internet searches. Saying things like, I'd be better off dead, no one would miss me, I just wish I wasn't here anymore. 45% of all childline counselling sessions were related to emotional health and well-being, including self-harm and suicidal thoughts and feelings, the childline annual review told us. So it's important to remember that you're not alone and there is some great services out there that can support you and your child or young person. In terms of getting support for your child with their mental health, there's a range of different options. The first one is, of course, to speak to their GP. Because supporting a child with a mental health problem like depression or anxiety can be really hard and it's important for a young person to speak to their GP about professional help if they're struggling. This should be the first step you take if you're worried about a child who may have a mental health problem. Sometimes a GP may prescribe medication to help a child or young person with depression or anxiety symptoms. Your child may want to speak to the GP on their own or they may want you to be there with them. It's important for you to support their decision if they prefer to talk to a GP alone as sometimes young people can find it easier to talk about their feelings with someone they don't know. A really good lifeline to look for is Childline. Childline is a free and confidential service for young people under 18. Children can talk to a trained counsellor over the phone, online via one-to-one -one chat 
or via email about anything that's worrying them, 24 hours a day. Many young people find it easier to be honest about their mental health with someone that they don't know. Childline Oz has lots of information and advice for young people on how to cope with mental health problems. Their website offers advice and coping techniques for depression, anxiety, suicide and coping with suicidal feelings, eating problems and body image, building confidence and self-esteem, mental health and the child and adolescent mental health services and so much more. And of course, talking to school, engaging with school, it can also help to speak to someone at your child's school like a teacher. Your school will be able to provide someone who your child can speak to regularly about their mental health. And this may be a school counsellor. Ask your child if there is a teacher at their school they might feel particularly comfortable speaking with them. And then work with the school to provide that support. When you're speaking with the GP or speaking with the school, or when professionals are speaking with parents, talk about a referral to CAMS. If a child has been unhappy or anxious for a long time or is showing signs of self-harm or suicidal thoughts, it's important to consider professional help so they get the right support they need. Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services CAMS is a free NHS service for children and young people under 18. CAMS can help young people who are struggling with serious mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, self-harm, panic attacks or eating problems and so much more. Referrals are usually done for your child's GP and unfortunately it can take several weeks for an initial assessment. Social services can also refer a young person to CAMS if they're already supporting your child. Sometimes parents come to the first point with their child or it may be offered through a type of family therapy but often your child will see a CAMS worker on their own. This is really important as it can help a child to be more honest about how they're feeling. And of course there's a range of other tools online that you can use to take advice for supporting children with a range of mental health problems. Young Minds is a great tool and a great hub for resources for things that can support you as a parent having those conversations about mental health finally i just want to talk about self-harm the reasons children and teenagers can self-harm are often complicated and will be different for every child or young person sometimes a child or teenager may not know the reasons why they self-harm As for many young people, self-harm can feel like a way to cope with difficult feelings or to release tension. The physical pain of hurting themselves can feel like a distraction from the emotional pain they're struggling with. Some difficult experiences or emotions can make self-harm more likely in children. For example, if they're experiencing depression, anxiety or eating problems. If they're showing a bit of low low self-esteem or they're feeling like they're not good enough. They're being bullied or feeling alone. They're experiencing emotional, physical, sexual abuse or neglect. Grieving or having problems with family relationships. Or if they're feeling angry, normal, like they don't have control over their lives. And of course that list is non-exhaustive and there's a range of reasons that young people and children may decide to self-harm. And it can be hard to recognise the signs of symptoms in children and teenagers. But as a parent, it's important to trust your instincts if you're worried that something might be wrong. Some of the signs to look out for can include covering up, for example, by wearing long sleeves a lot of the time, especially in the summer. Unexplained bruises, cuts, burns or bite marks on their body. Blood stains on clothing or finding tissues with blood on them in their room. Becoming withdrawn and spending a lot of time in the room alone, avoiding friends, family and being at home. Feeling down, low, self-esteem or blaming themselves for things. Or outbursts of anger or risk-taking behaviours like drinking or taking drugs. We talked earlier about the Childline Annual Review. Well, 6% of the Childline Counselling Sessions related to self-harm in 2018-19. But what can you do as a parent to support a child who is self-harming? I think firstly it's really important to offer them emotional support. Finding out that your child has been hurting themselves can be really hard to accept and it's natural to feel anxious or upset. Some parents might also blame themselves or feel powerless to help. 
But if you can, it's really important to stay calm and remember there are things you can do to support your child. Focus on showing them that you're there whenever they need to and whenever they choose to talk. Remember, they may choose or may prefer to talk over text or WhatsApp rather than in person. If they do feel ready to talk, try to just listen and not ask too many questions about why they've been self-harming so it doesn't feel like you're judging them. Let them know that you care about them and that you want to help. Help them find a healthier way to cope with difficult or upsetting feelings that they're having. But that also that it's okay for them to be honest with you about what it is they're going through. Focus on trying to understand what's causing the self-harm. Remember, self-harm is often caused by an underlying problem, like depression or anxiety or being bullied. It can be more helpful to focus on helping them with what's causing their feelings rather than on the self-harm itself. You can help them to get support for a mental health problem such as by talking to their GP or someone at school or direct them towards Childline. It can also help to ask their GP about a referral to CAMS as we discussed a moment ago. Sometimes hiding or taking away something a child is using to self-harm can lead to them finding other ways to hurt themselves. You could always try asking your child what would be most helpful for them and asking them to tell you when they feel they want to hurt themselves. Sometimes it might be possible to come to an agreement where your child tells you when they've hurt themselves. It's important to make sure any injuries or cuts are cleaned and properly taken care of. Serious injuries should be treated right away in hospital. Encourage them to find healthy ways to cope. Instead of simply asking a child to stop self-harming, it can be helpful to suggest something that they can do instead to cope with difficult feelings. Some things young people who have spoken to us have found helpful are paint, drawing, scribbling in red ink, holding an ice cube in your hand until it melts, writing down negative feelings and then ripping up the paper, wearing an elastic band on their wrist and snapping it every time you feel the urge to self-harm, listening to music, screaming into a pillow, talking to friends or family, taking a bath or shower, exercising or watching your favourite funny film. And of course, as we've said throughout this, Childline by the NSPCC has many more self-harm coping techniques for children and young people. The wall of expression game can also be a really helpful way for young people to deal with difficult feelings. And I'll make sure that you get a link for that in the description below. But the most important thing to do when we're thinking about self-harm is to help children and young people build their confidence. Many children who self-harm suffer from low self-esteem or confidence. You can help by reminding them about the things they do well or help them to learn something new and do that together, like playing the guitar or making crafts. You could write a list of all the things that make you proud of your child and that make them special and give it to them. Try to focus on the things that are about their personality rather than things like their academic achievements. Throughout this, we've spoken about different resources, but it's really important that you find the right tool to support your child or young person. The GP, professionals in school, professionals like CAMS and the NSPCC and Childline are all there to support you and young people. And it's really key that you work together to share information. It's hard to talk about depression, anxiety and mental health But there are people there to listen and there are people there to help. I hope that you found that uh, really, really useful. Coronavirus and the ever-changing picture is really difficult for children, young people, parents, carers, guardians and professionals. But by working together and recognising the signs that children and young people need our support, we are going a step further towards always being there to provide that safe space, have those open conversations and put in place those bespoke pathways of support that we mentioned at the beginning of the episode. Well, I do hope that you enjoyed episode 16. Episode 17 of Safeguarding Days, which is season 2, episode 2, 
We're going to look at the serious case review into the murder of Tasha Mead. Now, to give you a bit of a broad overview and a bit of a preview, Tasha Mead, 15, was killed in Hackney in East London in May 2019, having been permanently excluded in 2017 and sent to an alternative provision. A recent serious case review from Hackney Council accepted that opportunities were missed to help Tashim and that his exclusion was a catalyst to the deterioration in his behaviour. And in episode 16, we're going to have a look at that serious case review, pick out the learning and look at what lessons can be learned and what we can put into our own practice to make sure that the right support is offered to children who are at risk of permanent exclusion. Join us then, that'll be in a couple of weeks' time. It'll drop on Spotify, Apple Music, safeguardingdays.co.uk or Twitter at safeguardingcpd. Thank you for listening and Happy New Year.